everybody. Let us continue our workshop. This morning we have another lecture, Dr. <coughs> Christian Lange came here. So I will introduce him later. He will participate. We expected uh, uh, another two lecturers this afternoon. And good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. So any questions on this workshop conducts on the planning agenda? Any questions here from the audience and from online? Okay, great. Let's continue. So I, I will give a talk about the thermohydraulics of advanced liquid metal cooled reactors. And uh, please, uh, if you have a questions, you can interrupt me here or you can ask question, questions from, the, from online by, by raising your hand or also please use chat to, as you're now using to, to ask the questions and uh, other things. So from now, <coughs> I will start my presentation. Let me try to again to share it. So again, as I said, please interrupt me if you have any questions. Don't hesitate for interruptions. Well, I see the screen is coming. And this talk, a little bit talk, I will try to explain the pro so like features and problems which we face when we try to simulate uh, fast reactors, in particular metal cooled fast reactors with, from point of view of thermohydraulics. As you know that we have the thermohydraulics, structural materials, and electronics, three main uh, fields which should be simulated and of course we want them to, to be calculated and work together but I will focus on some hydraulics today. So again I will remind you some more or less what is innovative fast neutron systems and where is the place of the liquid metal cooled fast reactors here. Then uh, how to simulate with thermohydraulics main reactor components such as reactor core, rod bundle, fuel rod bundle, uh, or subassembly we call for the fast reactors, and also fuel pin. We will compare the coolant physical properties, mainly also for the sodium and lead. And uh, I will give you s several examples how to calculate, let's say, with basics or handbook equations, thermohydraulics, depending on the temperature limits, or you want to calculate power, or you want to check the temperature limit. Actually, the real thermohydraulic simulations is much com more complicated, and you cannot cover it in one single lecture. But we will touch this method, which can be used for simulations here. Uh, and I will show the, the, what, what kind of difficulties we can face, and especially for transient analysis, and how to do also couple simul simulations, uh, which couple thermohydraulics and neutronics cause simulate. Again, I, 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 s I already sh shown it yesterday. It's uh, we classify just to remind you, reactors by moderator, which can be water, heavy water, graphite, or no moderator for the fast neutron systems, by coolant. Again, it could be water or heavy water and liquid metals, either sodium or lead or lead bismuth or toxic. Also, it can be gas, like air, CO2, helium, molten salt. Sometimes we, we also classify the supercritical water as a, another, uh, let's say, coolant, which is different from normal water and because it has supercritical properties. By fuel, you can simulate, you, you can classify reactors like those 
which are fueled by uranium oxide or uranium plus plutonium oxide, which is called MOX fuel. A metallic fuel is also possible in, and molten salt also. Uh, there are several modern types of fuel like hybrid and nitride fuels of, of uranium. Also, we don't touch here, but there are, uh, let's say, future or, for example, thorium cycle. It used thorium fuel, which is actually not fuel, but breeding material. Uh, but we will not touch here. This is type of fuel which I used already in the reactors, existing reactors. By purpose, reactors can be classified for electrical and non-electric, for, for generation electricity and for non-electrical applications, hydrogen production, desalinations, district heating, etc. And also heat, uh, uh, <coughs> high temperature heat for the industrial applications as well. Power of the reactor can be low, medium or high, and for this we have classified also SMR small and medium sizes on all model reactors. Already I touched this, but maybe we'll give more extended explanation about the six generation for reactor systems, which includes sodium cooled fast reactors, both pool and loop types, lead cooled fast reactors, very high temperature reactor, supercritical water cooled reactor, gas cooled fast reactor, and molten salt reactor. Of all of these six, only very high temperature uh, reactor VHTR is not, is not, cannot work in a fast neutron spectrum, while all others, including molten salt, can work both in thermal and uh, fast spectrum, and supercritical water cooled reactor can also work in the fast spectrum, both in thermal and also intermediate. So just to give you an idea, the most of the generation for systems are fast reactors. Uh, again, there is usually confusion with terminology when we say generation, why GIFs say it's generation four? Because we had, they classified actually three previous generation. First generation was early prototype and demonstration plant Current flint is, an, is the second wave and the third wave, more or less, um, or half of them, approximately half of the modern reactors are generation three, and another half is old fleet, is generation two, so-called. Uh, there are several advanced reactors, both, uh, I mean, especially what, uh, what we call, call evolutionary and innovative. So evolutionary is more or less generation three and generation three plus designs, according to the GIF terminology and innovative design are generation four, just noted is there. So again, just notice that these generations are static classification, while in the IE we use this evolutionary, sorry, and innovative for all advanced reactors, which are relative classification. So what is innovative today could be become a evolutionary or old technology tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. SMRs, which are very popular and attract a lot of attention nowadays, can be also either evolutionary or innovative, means either generation three or three plus or generation four reactor. Here there is some sickness, but this is terminology which is developing and you don't have to. We have this IE Advanced Reactor Information System, ARI. Yes, so ARI, ARIS, which, collect, which collects all po possible reactors, advanced reactors, both evolutionary and innovative. And we can find the inform all information about these advanced reactors as they are provided by the vendors. We don't check, we don't, of course, evaluate or assess the, what the designs. We try to just to remove if they use this commercialism or advertising the designs. It's not allowed. But from the other point, all information provided the, are provided by the designers and vendors. And of course, there are many. I know how many. It's maybe about 80 or even more designs. I don't. I forget now. In in this database, of course, we don't expect that all of them will become a reality. As uh, Akira. Explained it yesterday that of many things like 
if you look at the market, the car makers, we have, okay, for car makers, we have like maybe 20 at least who are, who are producing. But if you look at the plane aircraft makers, it's for, the, for, for this civilian fleet, it's only now the big one as a Boeing and Airbus, this can only two. So don't expect that we will have all 80 designs there, but some of them I hope will be. Which one? We, we never, you never know. It, it's uh, it future will decide. Okay, so sodium cool fast reactor is a uh, uh, technology that ha this is has a very already very mature because it's we discussed it yesterday. The first reactor that generated electricity was uh, sodium potassium cooled fast reactor EVR one in the U.S. Uh, because of the, this. Sodium is a perfect, I would say, would be perfect coolant if, but there is a disadvantage, it's very important. It's, uh, sodium reacts aggressively with water, as you know, and also with air. It starts burning at the air without any ignition. For, for these features of sodium coolant, Dr. Lajay will explain us in his lecture, and he knows much better, and he has great experience with sodium, but I think, Christian, you can agree that sodium is the best coolant, coolant you can imagine. Eh? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for confirming. But for this, the system becomes more complicated because we need intermediate circuit between the primary and secondary circuit, which goes so to split, to separate radioactive sodium from water to exclude this direct contact. Of course, it also could be included in the, in the secondary circuit, but we want to exclude and then make the system more expensive. This is the thing. Okay, this is slide show the typical, uh, now let's go to, to the thermohydraulic simulations of the reactor here. Reactor core consists of the several sub-assemblies, which maybe you, I, I, I guess I will show you, maybe. Let's start from, and this is the, the if it works, yeah, okay. This is the core layout from the plane cross section, and this is the, as a, in the cross section in the axial direction, and this is uh, red, yellow, blue, and green. So, so we, things we call sub blocks, we call sub assemblies. In case of the Traditionally, for the fast reactors, sodium cooled fast reactors, we call it sub assemblies, while for the water reactors, those elements are called rod bundles also. So, and sub assemblies are construct the reactor core, which we have when you have critical mass, and then you have a reaction, and then the heat is released in the fuel and removed with coolant from this reactor core. Sub-assemblies can be different types here. Example of traditional, example of the hexagonal sub-assemblies, which are usually for, for the all fast reactors are hexagonal shape. For water reactors, it could be also hexagonal or, or also square shape. Typically, that inside you have the array of the, rod, of the rods or pins. Again, for the water reactors, it's a cold rods. For the fast reactor, somehow, these fuel elements are called pins. Just to show you that one of example of the fuel assembly of the light water cooled reactor. So you, these pellets are collected and inserted in the fuel, inside the fuel rod and fuel rods are inserted in the fuel assembly, which is length several meters, four meters, for example, in this case. And this is uh, one of the possible design. As I said, it's not necessarily hexagonal, but can be also square. If you, let's say, compare this, this for the boiling water reactor is square, for the pressurized water reactor it can be square, for the Russian VVR, it's already hexagonal, not square, but hexagonal. 
also shape, but still it's a big rods, or we call it, uh, in this case, fuel pin with pellets inside. For the graphite, uh, moderated reactor RBMK, also the Russian, uh, Soviet Union's and Russian design. You have subassemble is uh, of this size, and it's not, let's say, <coughs> excuse me, not hexagonal, not square, but cylindrical, cylindrical shape which is inserted inside the channels with, with graphite, inside the graphite mo moderator. For the Kandu reactor, which is in the horizontal, the sub-assemblies are this, the, of this, I don't know, one meter or less than one meter size blocks that are collected in horizon, horizontal layout. So what we can see, we can have here the square, rod bundles, cylindrical rod bundles, and hexagonal rod bundles as well. All they are used for the designs. Again, it shows this sub-assembly types and rod bundles, which can be of different shapes. Here, it also compared several uh, hexagonal designs for the VVR 1000, RBMK 1000, and then with uh, sodium cooled fast reactor band 600, f let's say with fissile and fertile material. Fertile means uh, breeding material for, in this case, uranium 238. This is also shows the cylindrical shape of the Kandu reactor and also hexagonal of board 60. Actually, they are different scales, so you, you, you shouldn't compare it directly as it is. The different scales. Uh, just this slide shows you the possible geometries, possible geometries. Okay, for the as SFR fuel assemblies, now let's go to the fast reactors and sodium and heavy liquid metal cooled fast reactors. We have this uh, fuel assembly, which is typically hexagonal shape, but frankly saying also square shapes were also considered for the lead cooled reactors. One time, but usually the typical shape is hexagonal. And because of this tight uh, allocation of the pins, uh, usually we cannot use grid spacers, like which is typical to separate pin, pins as a typical for the water-cooled reactors, but we use wires, thin wires, which is uh, rotated around the pins, and then this this wire separate pins to be touched and to 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 overheat and to increase the temperature due to this. this. So we need good to to provide the best cooling possibilities also. However, in principle, also for the lead reactors where you have the bigger volume fraction of lead, you can also use grid spacers. <coughs> and, and, and in breast 300, its grid spacers are used instead of the wires. Uh, you see here that just I tried to find out in the open literature the photos of the po possible fuel assemblies, which are, look very similar. Hexagonal collection of the pins. You see is the newest, let's say, natrium reactor pre presented by Bill Gates. Uh, actually by TerraPower, but he is also, st this is actually experimental mock-ups of the fuel assemblies, which, but you can see the, uh, compared with Mr. Gates, the size of, of this sub-assembly and how does it work. They could be different, of course, sizes can be smaller, like 96 millimeters, or even like 18 centimeters muscle. Different, different sub-assemblies for different types. Sometimes they are not covered uh, so there are gaps in, 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 in hex scan, what we call hex scan walls, or uh, without wrapper also, it's also possible. This is the sub-assembly of the Phoenix sodium cooled fast reactor, which was long in operation and provided a lot of experimental data in, in, in France. And Christian was actively participated in this work, and I will leave also for him to explain the details. It can be very complicated. Uh, basically, this is a sub-assembly hex scan channel with inserted fuel pins, but also 
other elements. For example, here you can see the so-called blanket, where uh, this is, uh, could be uranium-238, which is breathing material, which is converted to plutonium-239 during, uh, during the breathing in, in the reaction. So you have the, those spins are um, thicker so in, in, in the diameter compared to the normal, normal let's say, small 6.9. Here we have 217 fuel pins and 37 only pins in the breathing area. But this is co connected in the wall one subassembly. And that, okay, all these elements release heat and the coolant flowing through the, all the system removes this heat. And the purpose of the thermal, thermal hydraulic calculations it is to calculate how this heat is removed, what is the temperatures, what is the maximum temperatures of all coolant, cladding, fuel, and uh, how to optimize this, how to reduce the maximum temperature, or uh, from the other side, how much we can increase the power of this subassembly to not to exceed the temperature limits, which are given actually by the people from structure materials. They provide us the upper limits, let's say, uh, temperature of fuel should not exceed the melting point, but it's okay, extreme. For the coolant, temperature should not, in principle, exceed the boiling point of sodium. Never, let's say. But, of course, we should not be close to this limit. We should have some gap to, 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 <coughs> to be on the safe side. And also for the cladding, temperature should not exceed, of course, the melting point of, the, of, of steel, but also should not exceed I know 1,000 uh, temporary, even 1,000 degree Celsius, because steel can not survive even even in, in temporary of this, or in the long term should not exceed 700 de degree C for the steels, because of uh, in case of irradiation, steels are not. Uh, I mean, for these conditions, it's a problem. We can have a problem with steel with swelling and other things with steel as well. Okay, so if you compare the pin arrangement, and this is defined, of course, the geometry by the spin arrangement. If you compare here the between spin arrangement between uh, pressurized water reactors, boiling water reactors, and liquid metal fast neutron system, you can see, okay, liquid metal here is more or less sodium cooled fast reactor. So, so the fuel pin or rod is much bigger for the water reactors. Cladding also wall thickness is uh, smaller for, for, for the, because we, we want to keep it as uh, the materials as, as little as possible still to be in the reactor, but also it should withstand, it should, it should serve its purpose to, to hold and to uh, also as a barrier for, for the radioactive materials to, 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 so the, to keep the pellets and keep radioactive uh, fuel inside this pin. Uh, for this reason, of course, okay, why, <coughs> generally, why usually fuel pin rod for the uh, sodium cooled fast reactor smaller? Because the energy per volume released, energy density, power density in the sodium cooled fast reactor traditionally, at least from the very beginning, was much higher, like three times or higher volumetrically than in water reactors. However, now this is like, and it was considered as a benefit because, okay, with smaller volume you can release and more power, but now since the, in general the reactor vessel is still much it's, it's much bigger than the reactor core, so, and to avoid, uh, uh, let's say, some effects, especially during the transients and uh, potential accidents to, that could lead to the severe accidents, it, the new trend in the design of the reactor is to reduce the power density. Now it's still higher than for the traditional water reactor, but let's say if you compare a uh, breast 300, or BN 1200, the power density is like more or less than half of those in the BN 800, okay? And obviously, once you have 
higher power density, you need to have smaller pin to to avoid the, the maximum temperature of the fuel because the bigger pellet diameter, of course, you have higher temperature in the middle of this of the, of the fuel pellet. And to avoid this, you simply reduce, if you, if you want to increase the power, you have to reduce the size of the pellet, then you avoid this. Ideally, it has to have this zero diameter, and which can be realized, then it's all uniform, that can be realized in the molten salt uh, reactors, where the fuel is also coolant, so heat is released exactly in the coolant itself, so you don't need these pins on this geometry. More or less, you can consider it a zero diameter fuel pins also. But just to give you an idea, and then smaller pin diameter, you can decrease the maximum temperature of, of the fuel. So that's why we have smaller, because we have higher power density. We have to make this pin smaller, because if you do it the same size as a water reactor, Temperature will exceed all limits, possible limits. Okay. Again, for traditionally, those pins are, are allocated in the triangle rod array, but there are also designs where they are allocated in square rod arrays for the lead. One of the designs of Brest 300, but maybe like 20 or 15 years ago, was to allocate them in a square rod array because you need more coolant for, in case of the lead cooled fast reactor. Okay, this I already told uh, yesterday, just touch it a little bit, and I believe that Christian also explains the sodium properties, advantages and disadvantages of the sodium in his lecture. Again, what is important, just to repeat briefly, what is important is the perfect thermal conductivity, Excellent, uh, but uh, aggressive reaction with water and with air. Also, zero opacity, so you cannot do, you cannot visualize the in-service inspections, which can be easily changed. For the lead, compared to sodium, what do we have? We have this. There is no violent reaction with air and, all, and with water. Then we can eliminate intermediate loop, which is very, very important improvement here. However, since it uh, has much heavier, lead is much heavier, it's both okay benefit and, you know, the challenge. In fact, for example, we need, we, we, due to erosion problem, we can at the velocity of, of, uh, of lead should not exceed two meters per second. Otherwise, it will be affect the erosion for, for, for the walls. And uh, <coughs> uh, another thing that for the lead, you have to, to control oxygen very carefully. Otherwise, if you have very little oxygen, then you will not have this oxide layer on the cladding. And you, due to this direct contact between steel, iron, will dissolve in lead, because lead dissolves iron. And that, I mean, then you will, it will eliminate your wall and destroy the pin, okay? Then you still, you, sh you need to, to, to have oxygen in, uh, some oxygen in lead. But if you have a lot of oxygen, this oxide layer will become very thick, and then it's a problem for the blockage. It's, let's say, it's broken, this, this pieces of oxide material they can block and the flow passes in the system, which is potentially dangerous, okay? And it's, it's, it's probably, it's confirmed by the, the experiments or, uh, or ex an experience also. Not only experiments, but also experience. So for this, you have to control oxygen always in the system on the certain level. And this Concentration of, of oxygen also depends on the temperature. Let's say for the low temperatures, you should have keep the oxygen level is lower. For the high temperatures, you should increase, or maybe vice versa, I don't remember, but it should be controlled always. And you can imagine that in your system, you have some zones with low temperature, with high temperature, and this has be become a challenge 
controlling the oxygen. This is one of the challenge for the lab. However, from the other side, it's uh, especially allowing elimination of the intermediate circuit, intermediate loop. It's a very, very big, uh, let's say, uh, benefit for this material. Again, I will skip this probably because also I wanted to, to talk about the thermal hydraulics for the lead cooled, oh, sorry, for the, for the liquid metal cooled reactor. So we have for the gas, we have, an, uh, for example, gas, helium is considered as a one uh, potential <coughs> coolant for, for, for the gas cooled fast reactors in generation in a drift generation for systems. So it actually has very perfect properties, transparency, uh, chemically inert, so you don't have to make any measures, no transport to neutrons, no reactivity insertion, which you remove, so it does not affect the reactivity of the reactor. For example, with sodium, the problem is if for whatever reason sodium is boiled, or leaves uh, uh, the core region, and core becomes, we, can, we say void, but it's not void, but uh, it's the sodium is evaporate, or for whatever reason leaves the core, it uh, gives, because sodium uh, still absorbs neutron, and when you remove the absorber, the criticality becomes, becomes higher, what we call the, uh, in sodium cooled fast reactor, and also let the, the core is not configured, it's more critical configuration. So by compaction or by removing sodium, you can increase criticality, and that is potentially can lead to the severe accidents also. In this case, with gas, it's not a problem at all. The only problem is you need very high, pre because uh, to remove the heat, you need really heat, cap in heat capacity of helium, it's atmospheric pressure is it's very, very small. So you, you cannot, remove heat with helium, but so you need pressure like 20 megapascal, and this is also can pose some danger, still can be solved, and there are projects. I again skip. <coughs> Let us, uh, that was example how to, how coolant uh, in, in, influence the thermal hydraulics here. Again, for the sodium cooled fast reactors, we have two types, both with intermediate circuit, by the way. One is the so-called pool type, when you have this intermediate heat exchanger inserted in the primary pool, this huge pool, which is, has huge inertia, which is okay, because it, it could help in during the transit, could help, could, sodium is uh, with its uh, uh, allocated heat or cold, in this case, could survive uh, transient, many transients. And uh, for, but for the countries with seismic activity, such as in Japan, they require the pool types, uh, reactors are impossible because it's a huge mass of the sodium in one volume. And in, in case of earthquake, it's very difficult. It should destroy the vessel, I guess. For this reason, uh, for example, Japan is considering loop types reactor, which are smaller core, but th for this you need the intermediate loop separately. So it makes the total amount of the structural materials higher and increases them. Okay, now let's also talk how do we calculate very simply thermal hydraulics, and we start with the reactor core power balance. It's related to the, this exercise that you received yesterday evening, and maybe try to calculate. So, <coughs> generally, you have the heat is released in the reactor core and should be removed by coolant and transferred to the outside of the reactor. Then it can, of course, be converted. This heat can be transferred to the water, evaporate water, finally, and in terms of the steam will go to the, to the turbine and generate electricity. We consider how to remove this heat from the reactor core. So for this, you need very simple. If the reactor core is N, its total power is Watt. So total flow rate, heat capacity of, of the coolant gives you the difference between inlet and outlet temperature. This is simply balance and energy balance is here. This is valid for the 
whole reactor core, when you, you consider the bulk inlet and outlet temperature of the cooling, but it's also valid for the every subassembly as well. So if you provide the flow rates inside the subassembly, <coughs> And, in, and you have inlet temperature, and you know how much energy is released, so we know the power of this subassembly. You can calculate very simply the outlet temperature of, of, of this particular subassembly. For the power, we can consider also the total power of, of the reactor or subassembly, and I, I, it's the number of subassembly. And also, we can consider the power density. If we uh, QL is a linear power, which is uh, how many power is released per the one meter of the or axial length of the subassembly or of the fuel pin. Or if you have volumetric, so you can also calculate how many is released in, during the volume. This is simply balanced equations. What we can use to first to, 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 to do with your exercise. Once you have the, the power distrib total power, you can automatically, of course, calculate the outlet temperature, okay? Then you calculate this cosine distribution of the, of the power, of the linear power in the axial directions. Then you can split your uh, fuel pin in several blocks, like say 10, 20, I don't know, it's discretized, we say. And assuming that linear power in every delta Z, you can uh, calculate with this delta T for every uh, block. So finally, you will have the again, by going through this, all, all this uh, disc mesh, I would say, in the absolute direction, you will receive the outlet temperature, which should simply coincide with the outlet temperature, which you can calculate from the power balance from this particular subassembly. Okay? This is clear. Just let, let me make it sure this is clear. Okay? And let us compare now. So we were talking about the cosine distribution. Cosine is an approximation. So we approximate like cosine in the axial direction and basic functions in the radial direction. But again, this is an ideal approximation, which is of course depends on the position of the contour road and so on. But First, let's say uh, iteration or first initial guess, it, it's the uh, power distribution is cosine. Usually what we know from the neutronic simulations, so power distribution is simulated by neutronics code, like Monte Carlo or whatever, different code. But so for the thermal hydraulics, we already receive this power distribution as an input. And usually they give the simplified simulations or the designer give you the picking factor. So the coefficient which makes you, it's a maximum power divided by the average power, what also I gave you yesterday. So let's compare, compare this power distribution here, volumetric per watt per, per cubic meter, and also linear power of the pin for, it's maybe, I know, I'm not sure it's for the pin or by, probably for the pin. Uh, compare with boiling water reactors, PWRs, and uh, with, um, <coughs> with sodium cooled fast reactor. Sodium cooled fast reactor pin is smaller in diameter and also shorter, much shorter than compared. If you have here like three meters probably for the, for the SFR, the, the, it's about the active, what we say, fissile core length is about one meter. So it's three times less. So green is the power density for the volumetric here for, for the boiling water reactor. Blue is for the PWR, and this is for power density for the sodium cool fast reactor. You see, this is much higher power density, and that also linear power density in pin is much higher, so, and this has become a problem in this case, I will show you the Phoenix, Phoenix reactor, which is traditional and typical, let's say, SFR prototype. That, and you can see that power density, linear power density is double for, for the sodium cooled uh, fast reactor compared to, almost double compared to the 
uh, water cool reactor. Uh, if you look all now at the temperature profiles, this is on this on the right hand side you see the coolant temperature profile, and on the left hand side here is the fuel maximum fuel temperature. So, okay, for the coolant, it's uh, heating. The difference between inlet and outlet temperatures is about 200 degrees C for soil. Now it's it's less. So now we want to have it not more than 150, and in many cases it's 120, something like that, smaller. So just designers don't want to to this high power density for 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 the for the liquid metal cool fast reactors now, but it used to be typically like this. That makes it's a challenge to 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 remove the heat from the reactor. You see that, and temperatures, if you look here, it's much much higher than for the water reactors, obviously. Eh? Okay, and that is a benefit of, of fast reactors. Also, with higher temperatures, the efficiency of generation of electricity is also higher. If for the water reactor is 30, 32 percent, for the sodium cool fast reactor you can reach 40, 45 probably like this. So much better efficiency. You don't lose uh, this energy which released in the reactor to the, you don't waste it to the environment, I would say. If you look at the maximum fuel temperature, it's also higher for the sodium cooled fast reactors. Even for the same fuel like uh, uranium oxide or MOX fuel, you see that the temperatures is much higher, which is challenge also because uh, and also taking the burn up so neutron neutron so uh, amount of neutrons which uh, released in in the per volume of the fuel in this reactor for the fast reactor is much higher than for the light water reactor so we call it burn up and total energy released per per kilogram of the heavy metals are much higher in the sodium cool fast reactor. With this high temperature, it's, it's, it makes a challenge for the, for the fuel designers. That's why, of course, uh, from the one side, we want to, 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 to reduce the burn up, but also from this, it depends how much, uh, how much of new fuel you can produce as a breeding, in the breeding materials, from the breeding material how much plutonium-239, which is fissile material, we can produce from the uranium-238. This is also depends on the burn-up. Of course, not for the, of the temperature, but from the burn-up, but to have temperature lower, it's better in this case. Okay, and generally speaking, the, uh, the limiting parameters for the designer, if you have a fuel pin simplified in this way, will be the maximum coolant temperature it should be at least below the boiling point, okay? But of course, if you look at the BWR, it should exceed, uh, I mean, it, it just reaches the boiling point because it's uh, the water evaporates there. If you look at the uh, supercritical water reactor, there is no such as a boiling point for the supercritical materials. So it's, it's an exception of this rule. But in generally, it should be below boiling point. And I would say well below the boiling point, so you have the, some uh, margin to, to, to this condition. Consider also that not the, the pins in the reactors, core, they are not in the same condition. Some pins are, due to the power distribution, they can be more loaded, I mean higher power, and some pins are lower power. So in this case, we should cons consider the maximum power pin. And at the same time with, low, with the lowest velocity of the coolant because the uh, <coughs> outlet temperature depends also on the velocity of the coolant. Lower the velocity of the coolant, proportionally, you have higher outlet temperature. Temperature difference is exactly depends on the velocity of the coolant. Okay, another um, limiting temperature is the maximum cladding temperature. Let's say if you talk about zirconium for the water reactors, it should uh, be lower than 350 degrees C. I think it's, frankly, it also should not exceed boiling point, for example. And uh, ah, just forgot it. So the bulk 
temperature of the coolant, of course, is lower. The, the, the temperature of the cladding is high because you have the heat transfer between coolant and, um, and clad in the wall of the pin. This is defined by Nusselt number, and this is difference actually. It's, it's perfect heat transfer for the sodium cooled fast reactor, but for the water reactor, this temperature difference is much higher. It can be 30, 50 degrees C, while for the typical, for the sodium cooled fast reactor, it could be 7, 10 degrees C only difference. So it's very small, and that is the benef benefit of sodium. So just to understand, the, of course, the wall temperature is higher than coolant temperature in the same axial location, okay? And this is the limited parameter that for stainless steel, as the designer say, it should be lower than 700 degrees C. And this is the maximum limit which uh, steel can survive. And also should be lower than 1,000 degrees C under accidental condition. Another parameter, then you have uh, the gap, potential gap between fuel pellet and wall from the st stainless steel wall or cladding. In this gap, because it's a gas gap, you, you have additional uh, maybe 50 degrees C or maybe 100 degrees C, depending on the gap side and uh, heat transfer coefficient in the gap. You have additional delta T, additional increase of the temperature. So the outer surface of the fuel pellet is higher temperature than inner surface of the cladding. And then you can reach the maximum temperature, of course, in the middle of the fuel pellet that should not exceed melting point, never exceed, should never exceed melting point. But of course, you, you, you want to have a margin. And take into account that there are transient conditions, there are some transient, some accidental conditions. It should not exceed this, uh, in, in, at this temperature, melting, melting temperature. And uh, just, and also consider that the power, again, power has a distribution. And the, the maximum temperature of the fuel is reached nearly in the axial center of the core. For coolant temperature, the maximum temperature is uh, in, the, uh, in the outlet of the uh, fuel assembly. For the cladding, in case of water reactor, this is shifted, so the maximum cladding temperature not at the outlet, but a little bit below. For sodium cooled reactor, because of the sodium thermal conductivity high, it's uh, just below, I mean, it's actually the same as the outlet temperature of the coolant, maybe two millimeters lower, <laughs> if to be precise, but you can consider it the same. Okay, and another, uh, limiting parameter is the maximum coolant velocity you can afford. For the water and sodium, it should be less than 10 meters per second, but usually it's seven or five meters per second is allowed in the typical design reactor design. For lead and lead bismuth, it should be less than five meters per second, but now, the new, for example, for the breast twist reactor, the limiting parameter is two meters per second. That's why we also trying to calculate the, uh, the dependence maximum temperatures versus velocity of the coolant and, and this exercise which we distributed yesterday, okay? So when you do these thermohydraulic calculations, you should ma make sure that these temperatures are not exceeded. Uh, or vice versa, if you know this limited temperature, you should calculate the, the power that guarantees that you not exceed these temperatures. Or you, you have given power of the pin, you can calculate the temperatures, maximum temperatures. Or if you know the limits, you can calculate the maximum power of the pin that can be uh, applied to this pin. Uh, okay, how to calculate it? So maybe, of course, we, we can have this very simplified calculation, but typically, you have to solve the energy, okay, Navier-Stokes or Reynolds or Regis Navier-Stokes equations to, to get a velocity profile. And then once you have it, you can uh, calculate uh, 
temperatures in the solid in the solid structures like fuel pin and cladding you can calculate solving this energy equation for the thermal conductivity it shows simply two dimensional and transit equation from time and distribution in r direction and z direction depending on the volumetric heat in the z in this material here we affect 3d we neglect 3d effects for for the case of course we can also add this uh, azimuthal direction as well but in this case we neglect it especially for the coolants with good coolants uh, conductive coolants such like sodium so but for the coolant uh, this equation becomes more complicated and this is already uh, uh, a relative region of stokes equation which includes this velocity distribution if you know it for the <coughs> in the radial direction again neglecting the effects of the azimuthal distribution and in addition to the coolant conductivity we have to add this torb so-called turbulent conductivity of the coolant which is a result of the Reynolds averaging of the Navier's uh, energy in this case is, uh, energy equations both in uh, in the radial direction and, and in axial direction that because it, it could be it's not uh, uh, anisotropic so it could lead to the additional effects okay so to calculate the temperature distribution in these channels both inside the fuel pin and, and cladding and inside the flow area you need to solve these two equations and again if you if you neglect i think it's maybe here if we neglect this uh, transient effect for example for the steady state it's very simple it's a copy from uh, so if you have coolant temperature here this is using the heat transfer coefficients and Nusselt number you can calculate outside temperature of the wall then using conductivity equation you can calculate uh, inside temperature of the cladding wall inside which is t1 here then if you know the gas and for example you know the properties of the gas and also you, it's non-linear effects because it's also could be radiation you can calculate external temperature of the fuel pellet finally you can calculate if you know the conductivity and dependence of conductivity versus temperature you can calculate the maximum temperature which is supposed to be in the center of the pellet okay it's just in case if there is no central hole it just happens in the pellet but uh, the central hole it's more or less the same so for this you need to calculate this equation and very simplified you you have delta t in coolant you have delta t in cladding define it like that here it depends on the alpha is heat transfer coefficient here lambda here instead of k we use lambda for the uh, thermal conductivity of cladding of fuel and or, or also of the gap it's very simple looks very simple but there are complications uh, because the conductivity for example of the fuel depends on the temperature so i mean here you can solve if we have this constant you can solve this analytically and receive very quick uh, solution but since the for example the conductivity of uh, fuel thermal conductivity of the fuel depends on the temperature okay that means this is a function of temperature as well and these equations then cannot be solved analytically but of course you can solve it iteratively but yes, then you have to allocate mesh and, and do something do some the numerical tricks also to solve this and and it, it changed significantly from two watt per meter per kelvin up to three depending and for the low temperatures even it's like uh, all 4.5 and even five okay so this change in the thermal conductivity of fuel should be taken into account in in, in usually in the calculations otherwise you, you don't know what is the real temperature of the what is the maximum temperature of the fuel and which is the limit which is the limiter parameter here so instead of this simple relation we should make some numerical tricks and simulate it numerically here also the conductivity here in the gap it's not only 
because it's a high temperatures and, and transparent gas. So you have to take into account the effect of radiation, effect, radiation heat transfer in the gas, which is non-linear effect. Also can be solved analytically here. And so we should we need some numerical tricks. Finally, of course, the most, uh, I know not most challenges, but the thing that does not allow you to solve it all analytically, then it will have to use the empirical correlations for the Nusselt number. For example, one of like this, which depends on the peclet and uh, P2D. There are many, several experiments for the Nusselt number and for the heat transfer coefficients. So it's not accurate, but uh, this does not allow you to solve it automatically for the any configuration, because the empirical correlations are given for the particular particular configurations also. Okay, that was the difficulties, and now I I hope you understand better how to go through. Please, please, but but you should please use the microphone so, because we have the online dimension also. Please. Um, it's just a question about the, the gap thickness. Here we have uh, the fuel pin diameter is 9.7, mm -hmm. the cladding thickness 0 0.5, and the fuel pellet is 8.7. So it's like there's no, no, so no gap. In this exist, and that exercise, we decided to neglect the gap, so it's zero, okay. so to make life easier. For the gaps, no. But okay. for other things, yes, we need to be clear. And now coming to the. Okay, that is a simple equation, and uh, what people say how do we calculate this basically principle using, let's say, handbook equation? That is very accurate method also, because it's uh, basically from the balance of energy and nothing else. Uh, but since it's, uh, let's say, first initial estimation for the first iteration of calculation, because the system itself, including the reactor core, reactor vessel, and there are many flow passes, you cannot calculate simply using these empirical coefficients. And uh, you, you, you can have some approximations or evaluations how much you can have outlet temperature but you should know how do they mix, how do you receive this total. What, because it's three-dimensional structure also, you, you should know what would be the inlet temperature for the heat exchanger and outlet temperature, how the slow pass go, how these jets of the uh, coolant, when they release it from the fuel assembly, how do they mix. And there are many, many effects that you cannot simulate uh, manually, uh, let's say, with handbook equations. The, these slides I took from the presentation by the expert in CFD, Harry Royals, on the, in the regional workshop on the thermal hydraulics of liquid metal cooled fast reactors in India uh, two weeks ago. So he calculates, you see, the, split this, this, let's say, the levels of the calculations. Handbook equations at what we consider, then system thermal hydraulics, and then CFD approaches. We talk about them a little bit later which is Reynolds average, large eddy simulation, and finally DNS as the most accurate. The thing is that uh, this old CFD in, in more details require more and more CPU time. Let's say DNS now cannot be applied for the whole reactor coil. No, even runs cannot be ap applied to the whole reactor coil including, I mean, flow inside the small pin. This is too complicated. You need billions of mesh to, to resolve. With DNS, it's completely impossible now, very, I mean, and will be impossible, I believe, in at least 100 years more, because it still requires too many meshes that to, to, to simulate. If you want to simulate the whole reactor core, all reactor vessel with even the core only with this, it requires too many computational power. But it resolves the physics and gives you more details and more accurate, okay? But we have to stop some, in, in some point. And here is a 
fair action. I don't know. Systems, he says systems from hydraulics or relative rate equation in between. In between, you have so-called sub-channel analysis, which we'll talk a little bit later. So again, and systems from hydraulics, when you calculate, simplify, it's more or less one-dimensional simulations or when you set up this, uh, the, your meshing system along the flow pass flow passes in your core, sometimes uh, using as a core as a parallel system. And uh, okay, and then you go, you apply CFD, which is also difficult, very difficult to apply to them. Then we, we have the system, but one first step is to apply subchannel analysis for the core. If you look at this uh, geometry of the fuel assembly, you see that this is not in infinitive array of the uh, triangle allocate, uh, uh, al uh, pins allocated in triangle array because it has walls, has come walls. And if you look at the so-called sub-channels here, you have a central sub-channel, standard sub-channels, which we are sim simulating, choosing for simulation in our task exercise yesterday. But we also have the side sub-channel and corner sub-channel, which are more or less separately flow passes. For the side sub-channel, area is much compared to the perimeter of the, wet, uh, perimeter of the walls is much higher. And area is itself much higher than uh, area of the central sub-channel. But power is half of the pin is also released to this area. It means that higher area and because of the bigger hydraulic diameter, it's, uh, it has also high velocity. So in the, and in general, in the sub-channel, in this size sub-channel, you have higher flow rate. And the same power is released from the half of the pin to this area. That means you have cooler coolant. Temperature of the coolant is lower than in the central sub-channel. In this case, you, you have like low temperature on the side and high temperature on the, on the, other, side, on the other side. With uh, uh, so-called corner sub-channel, this small one, you can see this is also different, I would say. It has one, one six on the pin, but also much smaller area. Depending on configuration, it can be the relation between flow rate and power could be different but the generally in the side, you have lower temperature. Fortunately, or I know, uh, you have this wire, and you have a mix also, you have a mixing between the subchannels. So the actually the temperature difference between central and peripheral subchannels are not that much. But you need to calculate. You cannot assume something. If you assume something with balance equation, you will have very low temperature actually, much lower than in the reality in the much lower temperature in the peripheral side subchannel than in the central. So to calculate this, you have to use this. Uh, of, of again, C you calculate, you can in principle now calculate with CFD, with Reynolds average or Navier-Stokes equation, but uh, there is a more easy method which requires less computational power and rely on the exact experimental data obtained for this uh, kind of uh, sub-assemblies is what we call sub-channel analysis. In this case, uh, energy equations integrated over the sub-channel area and then you solve this and using as experimental data for heat transfer coefficients and mixing factors between these two as a, uh, let's say, boundary kind of it's not boundary conditions, it's like transport coefficients between these two, be, between these uh, adjusted subchannels. Okay, this is one way, and it's already, it, it was done 30 years, I mean, 30 years ago, and it worked well, and now it's improved. But again, now, in principle, CFD allows to simulate all this, in some, with some approximations, of course, all this sub-assembly. From the other side, subchannel analysis now allows to simulate all the core, all sub-assemblies in the core with subchannel analysis, while CFD is impossible to do this. 
and include this uh, in peripheral function. And uh, look, what, what are the complications here also? Actually, if you have these pins after irradiation, this is for the fast flash tech facility in the US. This is the photo of the fuel assembly pins before irradiation, and this is after. They swell, they change the sizes and dimensions, and like randomly, you know, it's not, uh, we don't know why. By the way, these two here, couple of here, couple of here, and some this, uh, they were extended in size such randomly. Maybe because they have some, it was uh, non-uniformity in temperature, or like this two touch, we don't know. But randomly, we have this change. So this is not ideal triangle array of, of, of pins, but in reality, it could be different. This experiment shows similar photo for the BN600. You see, there are several pins which are get out of this. And also, uh, due to the temperature uh, differences, because we have also different power distribution, then, then we have the different temperatures for e even within the subassembly. This actual subassembly can change if temperature here is higher than here, so you can change in this allocation. So all structure of the subchannels can change, and it also can change the geometry and can change the flow and temperature distribution. For example, you see here you have very huge opening and gap. Means you will have much lower uh, temperatures here. Even with, with mixing, you can uh, change it. It's a, it's a photo from Phoenix reactor. And that means it, it may even increase the differences. And also from Phoenix, you might see that some pins were touched each other. I know, so, so why I didn't, didn't serve its purpose to, to split, to, to distance fuel pins between them for whatever reasons, because of in case of irradiation. So you can have peaking temperatures. For this, you need very complicated simulation either with subchannel analysis, it probably, but it is uh, also the only first uh, uh, approximation but maybe also with CFD in particular areas. So here you have the touching, so we will have high temperatures, very high temperatures. You see, you follow my, I think it's very high temperatures here and lower temperatures here. That is kind of distribution uh, calculated uh, with subchannel analysis. You might see the maximum temperatures here. I believe it was this subassembly. It was 870 degrees Celsius. And that could be the reason why they can expand uh, differently in different uh, allocations. That requires more calculations. OK, uh, now let's, let's see how can we do this numerical simulation of the same subchannel we already discussed in this triangle pinary. So we can split. In the, so to do numerically, we split in the mesh. We select the so-called control volume or, or the small minimal mesh of sizes like this one. And we apply energy equation. Now I am, uh, and also Navier, uh, Navier Stokes or let's say momentum conservation equation to this uh, small volume of, of uh, solid material or small vo volume of liquid. Uh, Okay, once we apply this equation to, to this small volume, you can obtain the so-called algebraic equation for the disc, uh, discretization of this, uh, so which reflects the um, initial uh, transport equation in partial derivations. So once you have this uh, algebraic equation, you can solve it numerically, again, not analytically, but numerically, because the Gaussian matrix is too huge. You, uh, theoretically, uh, hypothetically, I would say, you can solve it also analytically, but usually we use numerical method, iterative numerical methods to solve. Then, once you solve it, you have distribution of velocities and temperature in this small control volume, and this is how uh, CFD. It, it's just maybe, it's, I know, it's for introduction, the numerical methods 
to explain how is CFD works. But of course, it's more complicated and requires long, you know, course of the lectures on how to simulate this. Okay, maybe I already noticed it yesterday that um, we can simulate, conduct the thermal hydraulic analysis as a nominal power. So for the given core design, for the given power as design is provided, we, the purpose is, objective of this analysis is to check if temperatures and velocities not exceeding the given limit. So for this, you have input as a design of the core, geometry, and pin, the core and pin geometry. You need uh, a number of the pins, a number of subassembly in the reactor core. You need to know the axial power profile or picking factor at least. You also need to have this inlet column temperature. And also you, you need to know the coolant velocity or distribution of the coolant velocity and flow rates through the subassembly. And the output, you calculate outlet coolant temperature, maximum cladding temperature or distribution of the temperatures, and maximum field temperature or its distribution of this. Okay, and if you want to conduct the study of the design, how much core your core can survive, you can, uh, it, it, there is an opposite calculations. When you again have the core configurations, you should define the maximum reactor power which on which the temperatures and velocities will not exceed the maximum values as well. This is kind of test. Of course, this is not like core designers invent the design and then give you please check. Eh? This is like iterative process, of course. It's, uh, they, they should know the temperatures and they decide, okay, should we reduce the diameter of the pin or should we expand the diameter of the pin? So this is kind of iteration process. And let's say the part of it is thermal hydraulic analysis, but of course it also includes the other calculations. Power distribution is given by the initial Newtonic simulations, but since the materials properties also depends on the temperature and the reactivity coefficients depend on the temperature, once you have temperature distributions, you give it back to the Newtonic analysis and Neutronics people analysis simulation codes will recalculate the power which can be now adjusted in some hydraulics and so on, okay? And from structural material, the changes in geometry, expansion of the pins, for example, also could be cal calculated depending on temperature. And then with expanded new dimensions, you have to recalculate neutronics as well, okay? Uh, this is one part, but when we are talking about steady state analysis. But in part, important part of the <coughs> thermal hydraulic calculations is the transients because, uh, okay, the steady state is more or less given. You even can, uh, can calculate the steady state parameters without using any CFD, only using the basic or like Ferry says, handbook equations to calculate this. And, um, but to calculate potential transient, which can be standard transients, reactor shut down, or heat up. You also should, during this transient in the standard condition, you should uh, make sure that the temperature gradients and temperature increase will not exceed certain limits, like say 10 degrees Celsius per hour or whatever something. So to start reactor, for example, BN 800 from zero power to nominal power, you need at least two days, two days to do this. and. To, to make sure there is no temperature gradients to smooth. This is, of course, over, you know, maybe, or it's very conservative approach to do days, two days, but for this, you should calculate thermohydraulics during the transient. This is what you do. And, but there are other transient, this is list of the possible transient which are subject to thermohydraulic analysis. There are several very important transients which are not uh, its transient and accidents are not proposed by the design. For example, unprotected loss of flow, which means you, for whatever reasons, your pump stop working, and also your uh, safety system doesn't work. So reactor is not shut down by contour road, 
specifically control road insertion to the reactor for whatever reason. It could happen potentially, never happened before, but could happen. And it's this so-called unprotected loss of law is considered, for example, one of the most important and serious accidents. There are other types of the transit which can which require this Roma hydraulic analysis, and we, we we have to do this to to understand. And this, of course, cannot be simulated by hands or by handbook equations. You need software and the simulation course, both system analysis. Uh, Subchannel analysis and CFD to calculate this. Again, I took it from the Ferris presentation, but I will skip what what kind of what kind of flows and what is experience we have. Ex we also need to to validate your simulation course. You need experimental data. Of course, you cannot do experiments on the whole reactor, especially you love transient. It's impossible. Huh? But uh, you can uh, separate effects and you can study experimentally several effects, how does it, certifications, many, many other physical effects, and then try to simulate with your uh, computer code and see if the results are matching. This is called validation of the computer code versus experimental data. Again, this shows also the details of the CFD analysis of the reactor core with CFD, pure CFD method now. Now we're not talking about the subchannel analysis and simplified system code, but so again, DNS is not possible and uh, low resolution Reynolds average uh, equation is uh, still possible for the whole core, but if you go to the reduce it, so f for instance, for full Reynolds average now with location. You can simulate probably it will take weeks or months to simulate fuel assembly. But if you want to simulate DNS, you can only simulate this small subchannel like here. Because otherwise the, the modern CPU power is not enough, and I believe it's now will be not enough. But with low Reynolds, low resolution Reynolds average equation, you can simulate the, your core again at all, but its low resolution runs are similar to subchannel analysis because it's a porous media on common. Okay, now I have to go probably to the to complete. Again, there are several types, in, not only the important in the uh, simulations in the core, but the effects in the reactor vessel. And have, we have a big pool with several flow passes, which is entrance, piping, and also we have many effects, how they enter heat exchanger, how do, how this <coughs> jets are mixed, and there are stratification effects when the hot uh, temperature coolant are collected in the upper part, and, we, and these stratifications it should be avoided because it also, it could result in the temperature gradients and other uh, undesired, let's say, effects. So it, we, we also can, with this, you have to use CFD analysis to calculate this uh, plenum. And this is potentially possible and done. But this does, and how to calculate the core inside, it, it's another question how to simplify. Systems from hydraulic is very quick and also popular in many simulation codes. When you replace all these three-dimensional structures with uh, one-dimensional one dimensional passes for the for the main flow passes and it can be also simulated which i will skip now let me show you this is the old astrid code which is now postponed postponed or cancelled i'm not sure in france astrid project is cancelled or postponed it's a good question <laughs> okay <laughs> Suspended. Okay, that's uh, there are the secret discussion on Astrid here in person, but those who participate in person can learn more. I sorry so for the online participants, but uh, we explain. Okay, uh, this is old Astrid code. We can simulate. This is example of simulation of the U U love transit simulations 
unprotected loss of flow simulation of the old Astrid design with simmer code, which is uh, multi-physics and includes many things and multi-scale code. Uh, shows you example how to simulate the core and distribution of temperatures and velocities inside the core. And since it's, it's multi-physics code, it has also inside this calculations of neutronics. So it calculates neutronic power distribution and neutronics. And in this case of transient, you can see the simulation. Again, so when sodium start boiling in the inner, in, in the inside the core, you have, um, uh, it, in, it gives you a positive reactivity because here the reactivity coefficient inside the core is positive. So as a result, the reactor power increases. Later, still we have a flow here because of the natural percolation and the remaining passes from the pump. So when this uh, sodium vapor moves to the upper part, to the upper plenum, because of this special design of the Astrid code, in the, in the have so-called upper sodium plenum, here the void reactivity effect is negative. Then the reactor power decreases when sodium vapor reaches this point. And uh, once it decreases, and uh, but does not stop. And that is effect results in this fluctuation of the reactivity and fluctuation of the power, which can also very uncertain, which can lead to the secondary prompt reactivity of the reactor and in, in immediate increase of power on several order of magnitude, which is shut down by Doppler effect then, but it will melt your core. Or depending on your modeling and simulation, the core can survive this effect also. Uh, this is, uh, happens during this, uh, already after 150 seconds of this transient, so it means this reactor is, uh, decay heat is removed by the natural percolation. Okay, I, I, I wanted to show you the figure, how, how it looks like. So, it, this is the core. You start, it starts boiling in the, in the upper part of the core and becomes, uh, reactor becomes, uh, power increases. But when it moves here, the power decreases due to reactivity increase. And this is like a periodical effect we can observe, which is, I know, at least it does not lead finally to the severe accident with core meltdown, but in principle, if you change a little bit, let's say if you change the coupling of the systems, it's uncertain, it's also uncertain, it's not accurate, not very precise simulations. If you change slightly something, it, it can happen that these fluctuations will lead to the also, to the uh, secondary pr trip of the power and it can also melt in principle. If you don't provide, of course, the external uh, heat re removal for these systems. This is another example how to simulate the complicated areas which was conducted by the I in the IECRP. But several participants, in this case, we in this RP, it's to test the computer codes of the participants. The experimental data were provided after the test, so they participate in blind, so-called blind simulations and try to validate the computer codes and simulation models on this experiment. This I showed you already probably yesterday. It's another CRP which shows how the, the after the loft, the behavior of the sodium evaporated and condensed in this core. And, uh, okay, let me, I will skip this, but you will see the some results of the Chroma hydraulic simulations of the several benchmarks conducted by Zaire recently. This is also I show you the sodium properties calculator NAPRA, which is now released, and I invite you to try this. This tool, it's online tool, you can find it here. This presentation will be done there. And for this, I'd like to thank you for your attention and complete my presentation. 
And if you have any questions or comments, I am happy to answer. Do we have online questions? Okay, please, please. Thank you, Vladimir. Just a, a comment about the, the velocities of uh, sodium and lead on one slide. You have shown a velocity of sodium less than 10 uh, meters per second. In fact, it's not related to directly, uh, I would say, some kind of uh, phys uh, physical properties. Uh, in fact, it's uh, due to the cavitation. Uh, cavitation. Uh, when you have a pump, you know that as a function of the pressures, you can have cavitation. And so we have studied uh, some cavitation and uh, shown that uh, it was, uh, if you have a velocity less than 10 meters per second, it's, uh, it's okay for sodium. But I have a question for uh, Vladimir about the velocity of lead. I have seen 5 meters per second up to now. In uh, several projects, I have seen they limit at two meters per second. Uh, is it because there was some progress on materials, for example, or uh, they are said uh, that it's possible to go up to five and the previous uh, two meters per second was too conservative? How do you, what do you think about that? Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question. This is uh, actually opposite. The five meters per second was previous evaluations. Now they become, a few years ago, I mean, 10 years ago, more conservative and becomes this limit decreases to two meters per second. Now it's two meters per second for the breath, for example. It used to be potentially from some uh, evaluations was five meters per second, but now it's two meters per second. Okay. No, because on the slide it was yeah, indicated maybe, five. Maybe it's old, yeah. Okay. And a comment about the sodium water reaction. Uh, there are two key, effectively it was, uh, I would say for me it was maybe too positive <laughs> for lead and uh, uh, just a comment about the sodium water reaction. Uh, for sodium air interaction it's clear that it's uh, really a drawback for sodium, huh? for fires and so on. We have to take into account this uh, reactivity and it's uh, clear that it's necessary to address uh, uh, this uh, point uh, seriously. It was done in the past because you know that there were many sodium fast reactors in operation. But about uh, the sodium water, it's, I would say my personal feeling is uh, not a so high drawback as it is uh, uh, often underlined. Why? Because we have, we have effectively the, we have effectively the um, this potential interaction, but the, the feedback, if you look in the feedback of steam generators, for example, uh, except may, maybe in uh, Russia, uh, in Kazakhstan, uh, BN350, where there was a large uh, sodium water interaction uh, 50 years ago, maybe, uh, we, we, we have the possibility to, to have a sodium water interaction in the reactors without without uh, consequence, large consequences, uh, clearly in Phoenix, for example. But now, by uh, design provisions, we can avoid uh, weak points in the steam generators. This is the first point. Second point, we use the sodium-water interaction in two main point, for two main uh, process. One is the cleaning of components, so it's easy to clean mm -hmm. the components with uh, moisture. It uh, applied uh, since uh, many, many years, so it's a positive uh, interaction, I would say. Mm -hmm. This is not the case with lead. Second point for the decommissioning, for example, for Phoenix, the project is we convert sodium at the end into sodium hydroxide with a process we have developed called the NOAA. We convert into soda, and then we neutralize to produce uh, water with a salt. After the contamination, we release we release the, the product in the Rhone River, okay, without, uh, without any trouble. 
environmental problems. So at the end, we have no more the coolant. This is not the case with the lead, okay? The strategy for decommissioning is not uh, always uh, um, defined, and it's clear that the, at the end, when you have lead, you keep the lead, okay? So you can say you can keep the lead, the frozen lead, and so on, but your reactor is, uh, it's impossible to come back to a green, to a green uh, land, okay, after the operation of, uh, of the lead. So I would, like, I would like to underline these points on the sodium water reaction. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. If no other questions, let, let us have a coffee break and we come back at 10.50. 10.50. We are only five minutes in delay. <laughs> 